Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to IP Day Webinar Wednesday. Today's topic is one of my favorites, building community in the classroom. And we're going to have a lot of fun today as we go through um, some research-based practices, but also talk about uh, things that are going to make your classroom more engaging, more fun, uh, more desirable to get to uh, every single day. So, uh, you know, get, get ready to uh, enjoy the learning as, as we get through the webinar. And I do want to introduce IPDE Director June Rawl, who makes this all possible. Welcome, Thank everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Oh, thanks, June. Thanks for chiming in. It, it, you know, I know the, I'm preaching to the choir right now, but IPDE is definitely the best resource for adult educators in Florida uh, to get professional development anytime that they want to access it. And my name is Brian Bush. I am an assistant director at Atlantic Technical College in Broward County Public Schools. And I feel very blessed and lucky to be able to come to you and, and share uh, some of the ideas that we try and push forward in our classrooms on a daily basis. Just some general housekeeping, all the, uh, partic all, all the viewers today are muted. If you do want to ask a question or, or provide a comment, you can do so using the Q&A. Uh, you can also chat uh, with each other using the chat feature, uh, but you are in listen-only mode. Don't worry about feverishly taking notes. The session is being recorded. It will be accessible on the IPDE website along with a handbook that's going to have a little bit more detailed information that you'll be able to get to as you try and implement some of the practices that we talk about. So today's webinar goals, uh, really what I want everyone to walk away with is having a strong understanding of uh, the, not only the definition of a learning community, but what that should look like and feel like within the classroom, not only for you uh, as the educator, but also, uh, and most importantly, for the students. Discover what positive impact building that strong classroom community is going to have on not only the goals of your program, uh, but but how that also supports the goals for each and every individual student. You know, we, we're trying to get to a point where all of our goals align. And we know that some students come to us for different reasons and, and, and our programmatic goals don't always align with each individual student goals, but, but really bring that out into the open, uh, understanding where everybody's uh, looking for and trying to get out of it. And, and that really enables us to be able to support each other a little bit better. And, and, and finally, um, how we make it possible, like wh what are you doing um, as somebody who supports instruction or as somebody who provides instruction in a classroom on a daily basis? What are you doing in your lesson designs and the activities that you implement with your students that are going to seamlessly build community? Uh, we're, we're not here today to talk about uh, and add another item to your checklist. We know teaching uh, in a classroom is the hardest job in education. So really, we want to you know, just kind of shift what we do, ap apply some of the things that we do a little bit differently uh, so that you have um, a, a new approach to providing this instruction that, that actually um, is going to build a strong community and, and probably make your job a, a little bit easier because what we're trying to shift away from is the teacher doing all the work and, and, and really empowering the students to, to take ownership of not only their learning, um, but the learning of their classmates and, and the collective uh, goal that we've set for each other. So let's go ahead and, and jump right in and get started. Uh, the, the definition that, that we're working off of today as far as a community, and this is any community, it's a supportive social group where members have shared interest, experience, and goals. So, it, so it's not just a group, it's not just a group that gets together, it's not just a class. We have to have a shared interest, we have to have a shared experience, and, and, and you know, not, not necessarily individual goals, but, but collaborative, collective goals um, that we're trying to work on for ourselves individually, um, for each other as a group. Uh, they engage in collaborative inquiry and provide each other social and in a learning community, academic support as well. Um, <clears throat> try and think of this, you know, how, how strong is my community going to be? It's not just that we um, are around each other and we go through an experience together. You know, just a regular classroom, a teacher-centered classroom, 
we're going to have an experience where, um, yeah, it, we're sharing the same experience. We come into the same classroom every day. We sit by side by side uh, and, and we, we receive instruction. Um, but, but that doesn't make you and I, just because we're sitting next to each other, um, community members. Uh, another example, we could go to the same gym and our work schedules and, and, and our gym schedules can align and, and we frequently end up you know, on treadmills next to each other. Uh, we're sharing experience. We probably say hi and bye as we pass each other, but that doesn't make us part of a community. So th there's more factors to it. Um, and, and this doesn't occur naturally in every single classroom. You really have to have a, a, an intentional mindset um, a, a, and a specific goal that you're trying to bring out uh, and, and do so through your planning, your instructional delivery, and the activities that you allow your students the opportunity to engage in. So um, that's really what we're working toward. And let's go ahead and get down to um, you know, how we do it. But before we get to how we do it, it's not always easy, especially in adult general education. There are barriers to building community. Part of having a community is having gone through something together, really getting to know each other on a, on a deeper level. Uh, open enrollment in, in adult general education in a lot of programs in Florida becomes a barrier to building community because we're going to implement practices that allow our students to understand each other um, not only on a social level, but on a, on a personal level and on an academic level so that we understand what each other's goals are. And as you work through those activities, you're constantly going to be getting new students entering into your class, um, students that are, that are meeting their measurable skills gains and going on to the next level or going on to the next class, transitioning, they've met their personal goals. So that turnover, which is going to be more frequent that occurs in, in K-12 settings, is going to become a barrier to building community. It doesn't make it impossible. It just means that we as adult general education instructors uh, need to be a little bit more intentional and, and, and consistent and rigorous with the practices that we implement and, and really say, OK, building community is going to be one of my primary objectives because I think it's going to lead to higher student achievement on a consistent basis. Uh, we, we have a transit student pop, population. Uh, Part of this is because they are frequently meeting their objectives and, and, and transitioning onto the next level of their academic path or into employment. Um, part of it is because they're moving, uh, they have to go back to their home countries, uh, their resilience and their persistence may lead to them stopping uh, attendance in, in, our, in our classrooms. There's a lot of reasons, but, but for whatever that is, uh, you know, if I'm in a K-12 setting and they give me my roster of 25 students to start the year, I probably still have 85 to 90 percent of those 25 students at, at the end of that academic year. Uh, it, you, you do that same thing in one of our classrooms, and, and, and I would argue you probably have 90 to 95 percent different students by the end. So, so again, it just creates a, a, an additional hurdle that we have to be mindful of and, and work through. Uh, poor attendance and low student motivation always going to be a barrier because because again a lot of what we're going to learn and what we're going to talk about today th these are practices to yes attend to our learning goals but to do so in a way that allows opportunity for our students to collaborate and and to get to know each other better if i'm not attending on an everyday basis um, or, if, or if I'm not highly motivated to participate and engage in those activities, it's going to take away from the ability to, to build community. Now we're just doing things together, but are we really struggling through these rigorous tasks? And, and we know doing things that are hard with other people builds a stronger bond than just, you know, completing or checking the box. Uh, and, and finally, and, and I would argue this is the biggest barrier to building a community in the classroom is, is, is a teacher centered environment. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of value and a lot of learning that can take place in a teacher centered classroom. Uh, in, in fact, I would say that most of these webinars are teacher centered. Uh, I'm providing some important and key points that I think, uh, you know, that all of you can remember. I think you're going to get some solid takeaways and, and uh, activities that you can implement in your classroom. Uh, there's going to be learning that occurs. But what we're not doing right now is building a community amongst each other because I'm dominating the discussion. Um, I'm determining what's important to learn and what's not important to learn, what's, what's important to share and what's not important to share. Uh, and it really prevents the, the ability to share community. Now, part of that is the structure. 
uh, and, and part of that is because it's online and remote, but there are opportunities to build community in online sessions. But again, there would have to be ways to allow you to, to, to work together. And, and that's not the structure of this. And this is a one-time sit and get, and we understand that. But for your classroom and your programmatic goals, you're gonna wanna approach it a little bit differently. Uh, and you're not gonna want your students to come in and, and just have a teacher dominated discussion. And I know because I've seen it, I've seen it in some of our classrooms, with the way that we're approaching these webinars is the exact same way that some teachers approach their everyday instruction and and again it's okay for that to happen from time to time but it's not going to help you build a strong community uh, where the students are attending uh, more highly motivated attending more frequently more persistent uh, your program attention uh, retention it's going to it's going to really contribute to all of those things um, if we can get away from that teacher-centered classroom and move towards a student-centered classroom and again we're going to tell you some ways to do that uh, so, 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 which came first, the the chicken and or the egg? <laughs> and um, really, th this question is is just to to pose so that we can all do some some reflection on our own practices and and the practices of our colleagues and the programs and and, and what we're offering students. Oftentimes, we talk about the barriers in a in, in AGE, and, and we talk about the barriers that prevent students from engaging in a manner that's gonna be the most productive uh, and, and lead to the most academic achievement. We talk about them going faster and further. Uh, well, yeah, sure, that's hard to do if they're only showing up two or three days a week and they're leaving early um, because they don't come back after lunch or they take Fridays off because it's a nice day outside. Uh, we, we talk about transportation issues. We talk about families. We talk about job responsibilities. Um, and, and we talk about the reasons where students can't engage in, in class because of their life circumstances and their life responsibilities. What that does is it allows us to, you know, it, it lets us off the hook a little bit because if, if they're not attending class because of all of these other external factors, I don't have to reflect on my own educational practices and what I can or can't be doing within the classroom that would make a difference to, to their attendance. You know, I'll, I'll take you back and I'll, and I'll talk about myself real quick. I, I do like anecdotes if, you, if you've been in my webinar before. So I'm gonna share some personal experience and some personal learning. Um, but when I first started in, in adult general ed, I was an ESOL instructor. And you, you don't know any better. So you, you, you go to your colleagues and you look at the practices of the department. And this was an evening class and our class started at five and ended at nine. And the other instructor said, yes, a lot of our students work and they come here after work. So they were reluctant to start and launch into their classroom lesson until the majority of their students arrived. So what they did instead was they handed out worksheets at 5 p.m. And they allowed their students to work on these worksheets independently until more students showed up. And then when the majority of the class was there, they put the worksheets away and they launched into the class. Uh, and, and one day we were having a conversation and we realized well, if I'm a student in this class and I know that the only thing that's going to be going on at five o'clock is I'm going to get a worksheet to work on independently and the real instruction isn't going to begin until 540 or six o'clock, whether I have a job commitment or not, my interest and my stake in attending that class and showing up punctually is now gone because I have no interest in working on a worksheet independently for those 45 to 60 minutes. And what, what, what we were really doing as a department was we were um, defeating ourselves by creating a, a, a barrier to the students trying to get to class on time because we did not give them a motivation to show up. So uh, what, what we did was we, we stopped doing the worksheet practices and we started doing uh, listening games instead because listening games allowed us to continue to push off <clears throat> the whole group instructional lesson um, and, and not have to worry about people missing the beginning of the unit or, or the learning target for the day, but it was a much more uh, engaging and fun activity. And, and, and as soon as we made that switch, uh, I, probably to no surprise to those of you that are in this training today, uh, uh, we, we had a lot more students that were all of a sudden miraculously able to show up at 5 p.m. that weren't able to get there before 5.45 p.m. before because they were coming from their job and couldn't get there any earlier. So, you know, looking at those things when we, when we start to talk about, you know, the barriers that students face, it, it, is it really the barriers that are causing the lack of motivation 
um, our, our pro poor program ret retention, low student persistence rates, or, or at times is it, you know, when they walk into our classrooms, what we're providing isn't what they're looking for or isn't meeting their needs. And one of the reasons that could be happening is because not only are the students not getting a chance to build community, but through that community building opportunity and practice, as the instructional provider, you're getting to learn about each student individually and able to provide more differentiated instruction because you know what they're bringing into the classroom, you know what their strengths are, you know what their learning gaps are, and you're able to incorporate those into your instructional lessons. And all of a sudden, when that differentiation and that personalization begins to happen with more fidelity, um, the student persistence shoots up, the program retention shoots up, the attendance rates shoot up. So, uh, you know, not trying to, when, when, when we talk about which came first, the chicken or the egg, um, really not letting the, the student barriers that, that do exist in the community and through what we do, not letting those uh, be an obstacle from every now and then stepping back, reflecting on our practices and saying, okay, am I truly providing and, and, and attempting to meet the needs of every single one of my students? Um, trying to avoid teaching to the middle, you know, so we, we, we're gonna always have our groups of students. We're gonna have, you know, the students, the students at the top that are high performing, ready to move on. We're gonna have the students that just got to us that are on the lower end. Are you just coming into the classroom with one lesson, teaching to the middle, hoping that that hits the majority of the students' needs and, and you know, just kind of hoping that the top and the bottom fit in where they can get in? Um, are you truly getting to know each and every single student on a personal level and trying to differentiate your instruction so that you can meet their needs? Again, um, this is why I say being a teacher in a classroom is the hardest job in education because differentiating, especially when you have a high turnover rate of your student population and your enrollment in your class, becomes more and more difficult, um, but again, should be something that we are setting forth trying to do on, on, on a daily basis. It should be one of our primary goals. So, um, you know, a, an, another anecdote that, that I wanna share, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about icebreakers, just icebreakers in general today. Sometimes to build a community, you're gonna have to get away uh, from every single thing is gonna be academic related. Uh, forget the need to start at page one of the framework and get to the last page of the framework. Your students are coming in with, with skills and knowledge already. So, so that provides you some time. And I know we're trying to get there further and faster, um, but, but one of my, 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 my favorite sayings that, that I heard um, by someone that, that's actually in this training right now, um, to go fast, you have to start slow. So doing these icebreakers, um, it, it, it is not only acceptable, it, it, it's, it's required. Like you're gonna have to do icebreakers and sometimes you can incorporate an icebreaker like activity over your, your curriculum framework and, and, and still address your learning targets. But sometimes you're just gonna have to do an icebreaker to do an icebreaker so the students can get to know each other and so you can differentiate, differentiate their instruction and provide um, activities that, that, that engage their interests. So um, this is not only true from a teacher working to a group of students. This is also true uh, for instructional leaders. And I know we have instructional leaders in this group who support instruction and who support other teachers. So as we've, you know, through, through my 24 year career so far, the best question that, that, that prompted the most sharing that I've ever come across is to ask your group, who was the most influential person in your life that helped get you to where you are today. So I just want to I just want to put that out there. You you all can see the question. I want you to take a minute to think about it. I know it's hard to think while you're listening to me talk, uh, but just just think about this question for a minute. And I just want you to hold on to who that person is, and just hold on to who that person is as, as I as I continue to share the anecdote. Um, one of the one of the interesting things about this is no matter who you're your group is, we, we, we could be talking to a group of bankers, we, we, we could be talking to a group of engineers. The, the answer to this question always revolves around the same sphere, the same groups. So a, as we move on, um, usually the, the, the most prominent answers are, you know, your parents, my mom, my brother or my sister, my, my parents, that, that generally 
um, comes up a lot. The, the really neat part about this question when we're talking about as an icebreaker, if you ask me that, you can't just come to me and I can just say my parents and then you're gonna go on to the next person. There's something about this question that makes people feel like they have to share the context of their answer. You know, why it was that person, what they were struggling with, what what that person saw in them that were able to help them become successful or what they achieved. So that's one thing that I really like. Um, but the answer that comes up more often than not, uh, not besides for parents and family, is an educator. If, if you had a group of, of 20 to 30 people, um, 40 to 50 percent of them are, are not going to talk about a parent or a family member. They're going to talk about somebody in education that was able to reach out and, and touch them and, and change their lives. Um, the, the answer is is not about what that teacher was able to teach them academically or education educationally. It was always about how that teacher believed in them, how that teacher encouraged them, how that teacher helped them feel valued and that they belonged in the classroom, um, how that teacher built a strong community. And, and really, as we sit here today and you reflect on your practice, think about the students that are in your classroom and think about them being in a room 20 or 30 years from now and somebody asked them this question, who was the most influential person in your life that helped you get to where you are today? And as they think about their answer, does your classroom look like a place and are you providing the activities and the support and, and, and the value to these students where you might be their answer 20 to 30 years from now? Um, and, and if your classroom looks like, or our, our teachers that you're supporting's classrooms look like a teacher-centered environment where they're telling the students important things to take notes on. This is an important thing to remember. This is the activity to complete. Um, that that's that's likely not the case. But if you're creating that warm, welcoming, uh, strong community, um, that that's where today is really going to revolve around and what we're trying to get to. So, um, you know, why why is this important? Um, Students don't come to class because you tell them it's important to come to class. They, they come to class because, and, and you can see that the, this strike through is intentional. As I'm writing and creating this slide, I'm like, yeah, they, they come because, you know, we value their presence and their input. Their presence and their input matter. And really that's overstating it. They come to class because they matter. And it's as simple as that. They matter to being there in that class they're 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 going to be empowered to take control of their own learning outcomes uh, they also have a responsibility because they are aware of and they know their their colleagues and their classmates learning goals and objectives the, these become shared goals and objectives we celebrate each other's successes uh we, we pick each other up through through the the, the low moments and, and and you know in that instance if i'm just showing up to class because i'm going to get another worksheet it doesn't matter if I'm there on Monday, because guess what? On Tuesday, there's another worksheet around the corner waiting on me. Uh, but if you really build a strong community, they start to feel a strong commitment, uh, not only to their own personal goals, uh, but but the classmates that they're helping support through this journey. By not being there, they're letting them down. So th this is really going to build uh, on each other and get your students in class every day. We want them to go further and we want them to go faster. But but that all starts with their their attendance. If they're not in class. The, the, they're, they're not learning. So you can see the little uh, diagram here where I, I think a lot of us, and, and certainly early on in my career, the, the only thing that mattered to me was content. If I want them to go further and I want them to go faster, I need to provide them all the things that are important to remember um, because that's what's gonna get them to the next level. They've, they've gotta know this content. And, and then, you know, we begin to understand and we begin to shift. Um, they, they, I'm, I'm not responsible for all their learning. I've got to empower them and they've got to be responsible for some of this, this learning as well. So their student input matters, their background experience, their background knowledge, what they're able to share to the community. Uh, one student sharing their thinking and another student responding, uh, be, being able to bring that to the deeper levels. Uh, recall is, is on the lowest level of Bloom's taxonomy. And we're really trying to get to some of those higher levels. And, and we can only do that through creating collaborative opportunities, which is also going to build community. Uh, so so how, how does this happen? Um, and, and we've kind of touched on this a little bit before. Um, it, how it doesn't happen 
is by having that teacher-centered uh, environment, really trying to build opportunities for those students to work together. Um, the practices in your instructional design is going to have to marry the, the, the multiple prongs of building community. And we're gonna, we're gonna learn what those are here in a minute. Um, we're, we're not saying get away from the critical content, we're saying allow the students to work with the con critical content, to touch it on multiple levels, to collaborate on it, um, have discussions about it, gauge their answers compared to other answers. What, what we don't wanna see is, okay, here's the lesson. I'm gonna tell you all the things that are important. I'm gonna give you an activity that's gonna help you memorize all the things that are important. Then I'm going to assess how well you can recall all those things that are important. And then I'm gonna give you feedback by marking the ones that you weren't able to recall. Um, that really, that there, there's, there's value in that only because they can remember some of these things. But as we try and prepare our students to enter into the workforce, we're really trying to get them to, to think on, on, on a deeper level uh, to, to explore these topics a little bit uh, more robustly and, and, and think critically and, and, and be able to bounce those ideas off of each other because when they get into a work setting, that's what high skill, high pay, high demand jobs are expecting of people that are coming in to, to take those positions right now. And uh, again, a teacher center classroom is not gonna lead to you being the answer of you know, that one person that impacted your life that's gonna be retold 20 or 30 years down the road. So build it and they will come and they will stay. The community of inquiry framework suggests that there's three components um, to building a community of actively engaged participants. So we, we really wanna look at what those three components are. We wanna intentionally plan for those in our activities now now it's okay to have a teacher-centered environment when when you've got the instructional piece you're tr you're trying to gauge your foundational knowledge you're trying to say okay this is the information that we're working with i've selected an article for everybody to read we're going to work on this chapter um, but once it comes down to it you've got to take that piece of content and make it like have it fit into this community of inquiry so the first prong or the first component of the community of inquiry framework is social presence. So this is pretty much what we've been talking about the whole time. Students matter. Um, they're not a number, they're not a name, they're, they're, their experiences, their history, their knowledge, their skills, their strengths. Um, the, 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 I don't like to say use deficit language, so I don't like to say their weaknesses, but their targets for improvement um, are, are sought and valuable and beneficial not only to um, their educational experience but but to the collective goal of the community you're trying to establish so what we have to do is we have to get to know those things and i know sometimes it's difficult because our roster has so much turnover that, that i'm lucky if, if i could if i could remember the names of every single student in my class and 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 you know We've got to know them. We've got to know these things about them because uh, not only do I have to know it and you have to know it as their instructional providers, but we have to have opportunities for them to share that where they, where they know it about each other as well. Uh, our rosters max out at, at, at 45 in, in, in Broward County. So, um, you know, if we don't have a daily average attendance rate that, that approaches 70 to 80%, how do I remember everybody's names, much less their skills, weaknesses, knowledge, strengths, background experiences, and, and personal things about them? That is the challenge. That is one area where we need to work diligently because as soon as you know it about your entire group and your entire class, a couple of them move on and you got a couple new ones. So these type of things, when we talk about icebreakers and social presence and, and allowing opportunity for us to get to know each other, if, if I was in a, a, in a more static environment, in a K-12 environment where I'm gonna have the same students in front of me for 10 months, um, I, I could really put a lot of heavy weight on this in the beginning. And you know, by the second or third month of class, we're not paying as much attention to this. You know, maybe we still have some opportunities to share and communicate and work together, um, but but those aren't in isolation anymore. I've I've incorporated those into learning targets through activities that are helping us move forward with 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 our framework and the standards that we have to cover. In, in the setting that we work within, 
it's perfectly acceptable to incorporate these activities that, that don't include learning standards and learning targets in the framework, just to have these in isolation alone so that we can get to know each other uh, on a deeper and more consistent level because then we become community and then our students be able to form bonds and friendships and that's what draws them to our classroom. If the only opportunity your students are getting to learn and get to know each other is during your classroom breaks, then, then you know, or, or not, not you, because you're you're here. We, we know I'm preaching to the choir. These are the superstars. But same thing with your colleagues. Trying to allow those things to occur in the classroom and not just outside of the classroom, because that's really what we're trying to get to. Um, and, and and again, um, each and every student's going to have unique characteristics. So just trying to keep those straight. The second component of the community of inquiry framework is is a cognitive presence. So. Um, let, let's talk about cognition, which is thinking, and, and really working towards metacognition, which is thinking about thinking. And, and, and again, if your students are only getting things to memorize instead of the opportunity to work towards the, the, the higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy and the depths of knowledge, you know, really working towards application of knowledge as opposed to just memorization and recall of facts, uh, those are the skills that need to be developed, and, and those are very hard skills to develop in isolation. They, they require being able to bounce ideas off each other, being able to get feedback not only from a singular force in the classroom being the teacher, but, but my classmates. So um, again, what is important and having one person in the room decide what's important uh, is not going to be an effective way to, to build classroom community. There, there really needs to be an effort um, and, and doing so collaboratively and, and pulling in your resources and, and, and our primary resource being a human resource, which is all the students that are sitting in front of us in class every single day. And then the final level is, um, yes, t you know, the content, the, the teaching presence. Uh, how are you able to devise lessons that are going to dig deep into all three prongs of what's required for this community of inquiry framework? You know, how are you going to be able to devise a lesson that's going to give opportunities for the students to work together and collaborate on, on a specific task or objective, uh, you know, that's going to push them towards a, a, a metacognition so that they're thinking on a deeper level, um, trying to solve a problem, trying to think critically, trying to synthesize one idea with another. Um, you know, that's where your teaching presence and your skill and your knowledge of different activities and, 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 and systems and, and things that you can give to your students to, to create rather than complete is really going to, uh, to help you here. The, 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 you, you have to know your content, you have to know your standards because those are the items that you're, that you're trying to build in and get onto a deeper level. Um, but you've got to have the skill and the instructional practice to do so in a way that's going to allow your, your students the opportunity to build that community. It is the, the what and the how combined together is, is really a great way to define teaching presence. And here is a look at the community of inquiry framework a nice um, thinking map of it. And you can see we get some ancillary or collateral learning opportunities when we apply this in, in the correct way. The center area being that educational experience or that strong community of your students. But you can see when we talk about social presence, the opportunity for students to, to be their authentic selves in your classroom and, and, and you know they matter when combined with that cognitive presence, trying to get that metacognition, you know, everyone in this in this webinar right now has value, um, is highly intelligent. Your thoughts and opinions matter. Now, giving you all an opportunity to work together, you're going to have some discourse where even though everyone's highly intelligent, we're always we're not always going to come to the same conclusions. That discourse is where the best learning is going to occur. Um, because you've created that that system or, or, or that opportunity for it to occur. Um, you know, this is where teaching gets easier. Your, your academic and student achievement gets better 
and what you need to do gets easier. So no longer are you the sage on the stage being responsible for everybody's learning. And we have a habit to do that because we're called teachers. So if I'm the teacher, I'm supposed to be teaching, but really just enabler or provider of structures and, and, and opportunities for students to learn through each other and those opportunities to work through that activity, not because you're telling them what's important to remember. Um, the, the cognitive and the teaching presence, so selecting your content, selecting your activities, what are, what are going to be those practices that you make all of this come to life? It, it's going to require um, some skill. It's going to require tools in your tool belt. As, as you we continue through this, there is a handbook that's been uploaded to the IPDE website that does have a list of protocols that you can use to, to kind of launch you through this process. Some of them you've probably used before. Uh, maybe there's a few new ones in there and, and, and possibly just going to set you on your way um, to designing some of your own as well and, and modifying those so that they're going to fit your particular classroom structure. Finally, the last collateral learning opportunity through this is um, when you combine the, the social presence with that strong uh, uh, teaching knowledge and instructional practice sets the climate. It really builds, builds the culture and the reputation of not only your classroom, but, but the academic uh, institution. And that, that's where your enrollment, that's where your, your student persistence is gonna come from and, and your program retention, you know, setting that culture uh, of the classroom because this becomes really really a fun place to be you know if, if, if i'm a student this is the type of classroom experience that i want to have um, not one where i show up and, and you know given a list of things that i need to memorize okay so just to share some of the the different strategies and you'll notice as we go through these they they do have some overlap um, you know, when we talk about social presence strategies, again, sometimes these will be icebreakers. And you can see the second bullet point just says icebreakers. And again, it mentions frequency because we know we have a lot of student turnover because of open enrollment and, and other situations. So revisiting icebreakers, and again, icebreakers may not have some academic value or, or not, um, but, you know, also sometimes these social presence strategies will incorporate some of the metacognition needs um, and, and, and some of the, you know, you're able to build in some of the specific learning targets that you have based on your framework. So there will be some overlap. And, and, and again, um, we, do, we do refer you to the handbook for a much more extensive list. Um, but one of the ones that, that, that I really like that's really neat because you can see this come to life in your classroom um, on a daily basis, community agreements put in a different way, classroom rules. Um, the, this is gonna be, you know, what are your expectations for participation? If, if a student wants to comment and somebody else is speaking, how do they get in line to talk next? How do they engage when they're in a group of two? How do they engage when they're in a group of six? What should they be doing when they present? What should they do if they show up to class late or need to leave early? What, what are all of these community agreements? Because if we really wanna have a strong community, it, it's not just those things that we talked about at the very beginning, of, of a shared experience, interests, and, and goals, but also we have to know how to act in that classroom. And, and what's really neat is, is when we talk about this piece, and, and if you give intentional effort to this piece, the community will come together, and when you get new students to enter and become a part of the community, they become the explainers and, and, and sometimes the enforcers when people breach the community agreement. Um, so, so it's always neat when somebody does something a little bit differently than, than what the expectation is or, or, or what the community agreement says, because you always have that one student who'll jump in and chime in and say, oh, no, 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 no. That, that's not how we do things here. This is actually what, what is expected. You know, and sometimes they'll say by the teacher or, or, or this is what's expected in this classroom. Um, and, and I think that's one of the neat moments when, when, when they start to say this is what's expected in this classroom because then that really feels like um, not only are they a part of community, but, but they're taking ownership in, in the structure and what's going on in there. And that's really one of your goals. Um, social, social presence strategies include just grouping students for learning. So am I putting them in pairs? Am I putting them in groups of threes? Am I putting them in a group of six? Am I grouping them for a portion of the activity and then regrouping them for a different portion of the activity? 
I, I think essentially and critically important, and I don't always see this in the classroom, is at times, even with adults, uh, we need to be the ones that form the groups for them. We don't want students to, to make their their friend group of three or four folks and, and in an ESOL classroom, you know, you've, it, it's, it's like a world map where everybody from uh, particular, you know, countries, home countries are all sitting together in, in, in groups and they never branch out and work with others that are in, that are in different areas. Um, really to become a strong classroom community They've got to branch out and, and it doesn't work if they're only friendly and know about two or three others. They've got to know about every single other person in that classroom. So, you know, not only the fact that you're, you're, you're organizing students to interact with the content in a manner that requires them coming together, um, but you're also doing it in a way that, that consistently and, and through your direction reorganizes those groups. We have a whole lot more in the handbook, so please uh, refer to that when when you want to have a few more ideas on how to how to address the uh, social presence strategy. Uh, metacognitive presence strategies again, moving this to the higher level of Bloom's taxonomy, the the higher levels of depths of knowledge, trying to get them to analyze information, synthesize information, um, even compare and contrast. Be, and become responsible for their own learning. Not sitting there as a receiver of information waiting for you to tell them uh, what, what's gonna be important to remember about the, today's lesson, but, but really taking ownership and, and having some idea going into it. What do I already know? Um, what, what, what would I like to know? What would I like to learn? What questions do I still have? So give students topics to research rather than remember you know, assignments to create rather than complete. Try and minimize your examples as you work through some of these things because what, what giving too many examples will do will, will inhibit their creativity. You know, um, giving them assignment choice will, will, will gain her a little bit more, more student interest. PBL, uh, <clears throat> often referred to as project-based learning, are uh, even better problem-based learning where they're in a group, they're trying to solve a problem. Um, they're working through that together. Um, KWL charts, Cornell notes, Socratic seminar, these, these are all really good resources that are gonna allow students to think about things on a little bit deeper level, reflect on what they already know, reflect on what they understood about the lesson, reflect on and, and, and inquire, more importantly, inquire about what they didn't understand or what they didn't know. Um, one, one of the one of the, the pieces in the handbook talks about the muddy part. When you have them in a group and, and they're able to look at their neighbor and say, hey, what I, what I really didn't understand in the reading was this. Um, and, and to have that other person either be able to explain it to them, relate with them, or, or say, okay, well, the part that I didn't get was this. Uh, and, and those are the type of situations that, that you really want to draw out from them. Um, to get them thinking and, and applying the information, not just learning the information. And then our, our final um, prong in, in this community of inquiry, again, is, is the teacher presence. So what, 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 when, when we look at this, all that we said is fine and dandy, uh, but this is the part where the rubber meets the road. Um, you, you've got to be able to design instruction, activities, assessment, feedback that marries the social expression and inclusion, them being able to, to, to express themselves, be themselves, learn about each other, um, them having an opportunity to reflect on their learning and deepen their understanding through application, um, and, and then being able to include their critical content. You know, is it is it about the critical content? You know, if you're doing this through, through an article on um, the Titanic, and you're asking your students afterwards what what you learned. What, are you trying to get them to learn about the, the to recall the events of the Titanic? Or are you trying to get them to be able to understand the main idea and the supporting points of the main idea, et cetera? You know, really trying to draw those things out through uh, addressing and, and, and providing opportunities to work through those three things. Your Your expertise or the teachers you support, their expertise in the instructional design is gonna be the key in the actualization of, of, of progress towards shared learning goals. Uh, you, you know, the students are largely going to enter a classroom 
and, and follow the instructions of the classroom. They are going to seamlessly blend into a teacher-centered environment, and they are going to seamlessly blend into a student-centered environment. It's, it's up to us to find the right balance to be able to implement these things with the activities and collaborative work um, so that they, they revolve around the critical content and the students are really getting, getting what they need out of the, out of the opportunity. Uh, this, this can all occur in an online class. Uh, it, it's, it's harder. It's harder because we're not sharing the same space. So if we're not sharing the same space, quote unquote, getting in groups is even harder to do. But, but you have breakout rooms. Uh, we can do polls. We're going to have a poll at the end of this. Um, you can use Microsoft Forms. We have discussion boards. We have post boards. We have jam boards. We have whiteboards. Um, and, and then really one of my favorite ways to, to address having the opportunity to work together and having the opportunity to share is by having a collaborative document, whether that's a PowerPoint, whether that's a Microsoft Word, whether that's a whiteboard where we're all designing a poster together, but we're doing so remotely. Again, your objective, even in an online class, whether it's synchronous or asynchronous, because, because we could have a message board in an asynchronous class where I'm providing students opportunities to get to know each other and bounce ideas off each other and get feedback, but those are the things that are going to help build that community to help them share that struggle through the learning that's going to draw them closer together and, 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 and create that sense of belonging. Um, and that drive to be there and participate on a more consistent basis. So um, again, a little harder to address in an online situation, but if it's a consideration and you're looking at it and you're like, okay, well, how am I going to do those things for my online class? You can get there. If instead you say, what's my list of content that I need to make sure that they all know and you, and you, you give a lecture, you give an assignment, you give them a list of, 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 of what they're going to need to know for the test, um, you're going to fall flat on the, on the community building piece, and um, you're not going to get any of those uh, residual effects and, 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 and our own goals as uh, instructors and educational institutions that we really want for our students because uh, long term it's going, to, it's going to lead to better things for them and their families. So uh, it relates a little bit to the principles of andragogy, just to, just as a little kick in here where, okay, well, what else can, can we do to make sure that these students, you know, like as a teacher in my teacher toolbox, how am I going to make sure that I marry, you know, social opportunities, metacognition, and, and my teaching practices to, to make sure that I'm working towards building community. Um, and, and it's a nice little checklist here for you to refer back to are these things being communicated as part of, of, of every single lesson? So um, what, what do I need to know? It's with them, what's in it for me? So making sure that the students know what's in it for me. And, and I think one of the really cool things when you, when you do a good job of building a community, you're able to, again, you're trying to differentiate your content. Students are coming with different background, knowledge, skills, strengths, uh, and, and things that they're able to contribute to the classroom. So every single lesson and every single teaching point isn't going to be new learning for every single student. But when you're able to share why it's important to know it, um, why you're teaching it in the classroom, because you know there is a group of students that are trying to know it, what's in it for me becomes what's in it for the community um, and, and that gets you a lot more student investment and student buy-in, even when it's those pieces that don't relate specific, specifically to them based on their personal learning targets and goals. Um, it, it gets you a lot more credibility for they understand why we're doing this and, 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 and they're much less likely to show up to class every day and say, oh, okay, well, they're not really doing the things that I need and stop attending. They know it's what's in it for the community that they are a part of because they know each other much, much better. Um, it, what, what are those background experiences that they come in with? And we've talked about this a lot, but it is one of the, the, the main principles of andragogy, um, using those student experiences and there's that, that previous student knowledge, valuing it and, and allowing them the opportunity to share that with others through, through your instructional practices is going to make them feel like, a, like, like they matter. They matter to that class and to that community. Um, you know, self-concept. What, 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 what do you, what is the student voice in those lessons? Student choice, um, 
you know, when we look at the gradual release model, it's I do, we do, and then you do. Um, as educators in general, as teachers in general, we spend way too much time in I do. And we should really be spending a majority of our time in you do. Uh, going around assessing and providing feedback during the you do. It, it, it may be uncomfortable, it may not be what we're used to. You're gonna see your students struggle. That academic struggle is really where a lot of the authentic learning occurs. So allow that to happen um, and, and the students are gonna feel more empowered and they're gonna learn more um, through making the mistakes and, and, and allowing that opportunity for them to work with what you're trying to um, get them to come away with. Meet them where they are, circle back, start over, um, especially with social presence, you know, are, are they ready to move forward? And, 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 you know, when we talk about andragogy, they're talking about content here, but, but, but what I'm referring to is also readiness for them to be a part of the community. If it's my first day in that classroom, I may not be as ready to share. I may still be intimidated. Um, I may be worried I'm going to mispronounce something. I may be worried I'm going to get something wrong. There's going to need to be tender and gentle steps as you move forward with them, trying to get them to be ready um, for what you're trying to accomplish. So, uh, you know, don't be afraid to, to, to circle back to, to, you know, differentiate and, 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 and meet them where they are, where if they're not quite ready to jump in according to your community agreements where you expect them to be, you know, what are those baby steps that are going to help them get there and how do you meet them there and then help, you know, lift them up to where you want them to be once they become more, more, more comfortable. Um, and, and again, problem orientation. This is the metacognition piece. Uh, nobody's trying to come in and memorize. Nobody's trying to go from page one to the last page of the book. Uh, what's the practical application of the knowledge of the learning targets that's gonna allow me to be able to solve real world practical problems, perform tasks that are gonna be needed um, out in the real world um, and just develop those skills uh, through practice, trial and error, through making mistakes is gonna be my opportunity to learn. If I don't have an opportunity to make mistakes because I'm not getting assignments that allow me to work through and work with the knowledge because all I'm doing is taking notes on the list of facts that you're giving me, um, it's a deficit and our, our students really deserve better than that. Um, so, so, you know, kind of as a, as a, a parting moment here, where do we go with all of this? What is your action plan? What is, you know, from my perspective, what I hope that you walk away with from today's webinar is, you know, reflecting on your, your, your instructional practices are the instructional practices you observe of those that you're able to support. Um, are they student centered? You know, and, and I don't think anyone could be student centered 100% of the time, but you know, that's really what we're trying to push towards and, and, and be a part of. Um, do they allow for individual self-expression? You know, we, we could have just a whole bunch of student-centered activities, but they're always content-driven. Do I ever get opportunities to talk about and share about myself personally? And I think that's really important, uh, especially if you want to move forward with a goal of, of building that strong community. Um, do they allow for students to think about thinking? You know, it, it, you, you could put me in a group assignment, but it could really just still be to complete a worksheet together, <laughs> you know, and, and I complete it individually and my neighbor completes it individually. And then we check our answers off of each other. Did it really make me go deeper in my thinking um, and, and, and do all of these things revolve around the critical content? Because that, that's really where the challenge is. So, you know, those are some key questions that you can, that you can look back on and reflect for your instructional practice. And, and, and you know, really, not just saying, okay, in the last year, what does this look like? But, you know, really examining it and, and, and saying, does this lesson, is this lesson student-centered? Does it allow for individual self-expression? Does it allow students to think about thinking, you know, and, and really applying that to every single lesson? Uh, uh, again, teaching is the hardest job in education. It's much easier for me to come in here and talk about what this should look like versus doing it on a day-to-day -day basis of, of six hours of classroom instruction or whatever the setup is at, at your institution. Um, maintaining a growth mindset, so important. Not only for you, but to develop that growth mindset with your students. Don't let good be the enemy of great. Students are going to learn in most every structure that we deliver instruction in. 
So just because they're learning, just because they're showing gains, um, don't let that stop you from experimenting and trying different things because there may be something better that's out there. So don't let good be the enemy of great. Um, there, there's always room for improvement. And, and if you have a teacher-centered environment, you know, to take a chance and, and try and implement some of these things, um, see what the results are, get the feedback from the students and, and really see, um, you know, if it's something that you want to do more and more, because I think you're, you're really going to enjoy it. Your students are going to have more fun and, and it's going to be a lot easier than being responsible for every single piece of learning and feedback that occurs inside the classroom. Um, and then your last action plan you're already doing, utilize IPTE resources, upcoming webinars to put more tools in your tool belt. We don't know what we don't know. Um, participating in these things, using the handbooks, attending the webinars. Um, I, I went ahead and, 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 and pointed out some that I think relate directly. I mean, if this topic grabs your interest, uh, on October 5th, well, actually the week before that, IPTE is starting a three-part series. On October 5th, really uh, leveraging the multidimensional reality of the adult ESOL classroom through differentiated teaching strategies. If you're going to be differentiating teaching, you have to know about your students' strengths and, and, and their learning gaps. So that one's going to be really a good one that's going to help, you know, conceptualize and frame some of the topics that we talked about today. Um, if, if you pull this PowerPoint down from the IPTE web, website, these are clickable links on this PowerPoint. Uh, they are also shared in the handbook. So assessing student progress toolkit, uh, effective student orientation, setting the stage for student success. That's relevant to today's topic because it talks about um, really getting to know your, your students on, on a personal level. Teachers helping learners to develop learner autonomy, making them responsible for their own learning, part of community building, um, and, and, and you know the super six principles of andragogy, take your program from good to great. So those are some recommended ones that relate directly to today's topic, but there is all you can eat buffet of PD on the IPTE website. Please enjoy all that you want to. Here's some um, references from some of the knowledge and research-based practices we talked about today. And, and really before we wrap up today's Wednesday webinar, we did want to look and see if there was any questions, but I think those have been answered as we go. So thank you to, the, to those that have been answering those questions and engaging with each other through this. And that'll finally bring us to our feedback. And I think June Rawl is going to come back on and, and take us home. Brian, thank you so much. That was very informative and very insightful. So thank you so much for your time and effort in putting that together for us. You will now see three short questions that appear on your screen. If you would take a few seconds to answer them. We always want to hear from you and love your feedback. As you do that, I want to remind you that next week's webinar Wednesday is aligning TABE scores to grade ranges and workforce readiness, a new reporting portal that aligns to workforce readiness and ONET. So that will be next Wednesday on uh, August 31st. Until then, please be safe and thank you so much for all that you do for adult education.